you bargain that the price that you come up is the result of some sort of, sort of silent bargaining process between two people that you yeah. can't really even observe. In this week's episode of the Mixtape Podcast, I had the opportunity to interview Katie Grady. Katie is a PhD economist at Brandeis University, where she is both a professor in the economics department as well as the dean of its international business school. Katie did her PhD in economics at Princeton University in the early 1990s, which as some of you may have figured out by now is a place and time of special interest to me because of that department's central role in helping birth an approach to causal inference that ultimately became extremely influential. In this interview, we discuss her love of theory, like bargaining models and price discrimination, as well as studying unusual markets like huge open air fish markets and art itself. We talked about how she uses theory and data to understand these markets, as well as its workers, as well as just the joy of collecting data yourself and applying economics to new things. I hope you really enjoy listening to and learning about Katie and her life as much as I did. She's a very cool person with an approach to learning that I think many of us can still relate to. My name is Scott Cunningham and this is Mixtape, the podcast. Okay, this is uh, really neat to get to talk to uh, Kate, Katie Grady. A long, I am a long time uh, fan, first time to ever meet you. Uh, thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you, Scott, it's great to be here. Can, before we get started, um, can you tell us for, for those that are listening and watching uh, where you work right now and what your uh, occupation title is? Uh, yes. So um, I am the dean of Brandeis International Business School, and I'm also the Fred and Rita Richmond Distinguished Professor of Economics. Uh, Brandeis is located right outside Boston. Great. Great. Okay. Before we get into to your career and your life. Uh, can you tell me where you grew up and what were you like as a kid? Oh gosh, yes. I grew up in Florida. Um, as I was born and raised in Florida. Um, and I um, you know, was both very sporty. So I played tennis and I played, in fact, played tennis in college. Um, oh, okay. And I also read a lot and I really liked math. Uh, and so then you go, so you liked math and you liked reading. So that's gonna, that, that's really interesting because you're career, I want to talk about uh, your, your career in creativity and art. Uh, what, what do you, what kind of uh, interest in art and creativity do you have kind of as a young person? Um, well, I played the piano, so I took piano lessons. So in music, um, did not do a lot on art as a young person. I got interested in art through my interest in price discrimination. Oh. Um, and meeting some artists who uh, we were concerned about the way uh, that their works were being priced. So oh. that's how my interest in art started. Oh, interesting. Oh, okay. Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, shoot. That got, those are my questions at the end of the, the end of the interview thing, but I want to talk about them now, but I, I got to go in order. So, so tell me how you ended up at Princeton. When were, when did you get there and when did you graduate? Okay, so um, I, I'll tell you, I, I did my undergraduate at Tulane um, oh. in um, math and Russian. So I double majored um, okay. and uh, then went straight to Columbia Business School and um, uh, did a finance and marketing concentration and then uh, worked for Cargill for two years, uh, both as a uh, bond trader and as a uh, corn gluten meal trader. It's a chicken feed basically is what oh, it is. Wow. Um, and we'd hedge with soybean meal futures. So um, oh. I worked for two years, but I knew right after starting at Cargill that I wanted to go back uh, to do a PhD. And yeah. so when I was working at Cargill, I applied uh, to um, you know a few schools to go back to, be, uh, to do a PhD and I chose to go to Princeton. So oh, that's how, how I could got. you tell, how could you tell that you, what, what was the, what was sort of the burning thing inside you that made you wanted to get a PhD in economics? Oh, um, well, first of all, I was, you know, I felt I was good at math and good at, good at writing or reading, but wasn't stellar at either. Like I wasn't going to be, I mean, I mean, I wasn't going to become a theoretical mathematician, yeah. nor were my skills enough to become a historian on the other side. So I thought economics was sort of middle of the ground. 
Right. Um, uh, I also knew from trading that my, it's in my nature to think about things. Um, so split second trading decisions, it was fine. Um, but um, I did best when I had some time to think about things. Oh, and I missed gosh. academia. I just missed academia. You liked it. You liked to be a yeah. student and just being around thinking and stuff. Exactly. And yeah. those were some of the best four years of my life. I really enjoyed doing the future. Oh, you did it in four absolutely. years? Yeah, I absolutely enjoyed it, though. Oh, yeah. What do you love about it so much? You know, the people that I were around was around. I mean, my friends, you're around. You're, everybody you're around is smart and really trying to do something. And um, just there was a lot of energy. Um, I started out doing bargaining theory. And again, mm -hmm. coming up with, I, I liked coming up with ideas that nobody had thought of and then trying, you know, maybe they're stupid ideas, okay? Then not everyone's a brilliant idea. But, but then not only be able to coming up with your ideas, but also being able to test them and to follow them up. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was just really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's oh, so, so yeah. Um, boy, we're very similar. Uh, I also in graduate school was, that's exactly, I haven't put it into those words, but I was also very interested in bargaining and coming up with these, these bargaining models, these Nash bargaining models in my, in my IO class that were about all kinds of stuff or like I wrote in IO for our two IO classes, um, the economics of, uh, genre in movies it was oh, just like, interesting yeah it was yeah. all this it was all this like monopolistic competition stuff that i didn't call it that but i was just just it was it's weirdly you know economics for a creative person is just seems like it's just so it, it can be very creative it's very lot, creative i don't no, think a lot of people think that my first advisor was ariel rubenstein um uh oh who, yeah um uh, um and his basically who was a specialist on bargaining and his bargaining model. And um, my very first paper was an overlapping generations of bargaining. And it was just, you know, where does this lead you? This is the, um, and it just got me excited basically. Yeah. 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 Well, how, so, so you didn't stick with him though. So you sort of transitioned away from this, what, what's going on in your head at that time? Well, I wanted to test out bargaining. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I originally went to the Fulton fish market. Okay. Oh. So I, I, um, was interested not only in theory, theory was very big back then, but, but I really wanted to test out something. So, um, I went to the, um, there was what a, what year is this real quick, Katie? What year are we at? 1992, I think the spring of 1992. So I started in 89, um, you know, did a couple years, uh, you know, first of, of courses, um, wrote my, uh, um, my, my, my paper. And then my first, um, um, my fir first chapter of my thesis was this, this overlapping generations of bargaining. But by the time of spring of 92, I wanted to go out and see if I could do something empirically to test any of these bargaining models. Yeah. And um, you're not, it's interesting. You're not just like, well, let me go download something from the PSID. You're going to like go no, get data. That, yeah. Downloading was not what I wanted to do. Okay. Right. I mean, I, it, it was, you know, Back then, it was very important, but that that I kind of wanted to be out there, and, and that's always been. And I would not do not regret that in any sense of the word. Going out and getting your own data. What did um, you like about that? Why do you? Why were you drawn? Because I bet that's a feature of your personality. What 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 is it you liked about that? I mean, isn't it much more fun going to the fish market, seeing fish, and talking to people, and seeing the prices happening than yeah. going to a computer and downloading something? Oh gosh, I bet I you mean, had so um, much fun. Yeah, I mean, and I, I wrote in with the uh, Princeton fishmonger, um, um, and we, you know, get there at um, two in the morning, um, two days a week, or three in the morning on the other days of the week. And um, I learned a lot about fish, about cooking fish. Okay, um, and uh, it was just very interesting. It was also interesting because Fulton was quite near Wall Street, and you could even imagine sort of some of the traders being Wall Street traders, but they're not. They're at the market. Right, so, right. You recognize that in them because of your own kind of prior. Having practice. traded, yes, I was yeah. interested. In you could tell what they were. You the trading tell. actually got me interested in bargaining too. So yes. Mm. Okay, all right. So what is the Fulton Fish Project? Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell for the sake of people listening. Okay, so I originally went down there thinking that I could observe some bargaining. 
okay, because there are no posted prices at the Fulton Fish Market. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I met one of the seafood um, uh, sellers and um, uh, got some data. I think I went down a couple times, got a little bit of data and uh, took it back to Princeton and uh, can't, can't even remember who. Somebody said I should go talk to Orly Ashenfelter, that he would be interested. So I took my data to Orly Ashenfelter and he said, oh no, you know, that's great. Oh, I got some of their uh, uh, data from their inventory data. I got some sheets on prices. And Orly says, you know, this is all fine, but you got to go down there. He says, go down there for a month, okay? Spend every day and write down prices, okay? Collect your own data. So I said, uh, well, okay. So um, I did. I spent a month down there uh, standing next to the Whiting dealer. Uh, Timmy was his name. And basically wrote down, um, uh, uh, you know, every price of, of uh, per pound of whiting that was sold. They also sold other fish, but they would have boxes writing, so you could see how much, how many boxes were out there. Um, you could see the quality of the box. I'd ask him the quality. I couldn't, you know, I got a pretty good judge, but I'd ask him, you know, what quality of this. Somebody would come up, and he would give him a price. Yeah. And um, you know, you, you can see how much they bought, when they bought. Um, I also wrote down the ethnicity of the buyer because are they were, negotiating uh, the price? It's not like a market price is just emerging. It's, no, no, it's no. And I was the they negotiate it. Yes, no, there are no market prices. And somebody had come up and say, you know, Timmy would say, well, it's ninety cents a pound, and the guy would say, hey, you know, your your friend over there is offering eighty cents a pound, and um, you know, then they'd go off, and I didn't, I couldn't actually observe the whole thing. Timmy put his arm around the guy, and they'd go off and have this conversation. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then they'd come up with a price and right. then I'd find the final price and I'd write down the final price. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, do you, you think know, your bargaining model was, was, was useful? Uh, no, no, no. And that's what I, you know, I, it didn't have a lot to do at all. I mean, they would come up with a price. I couldn't, I, I didn't see a way to use this to test it. I mean, while bargaining was happening, certainly I couldn't observe it happening. You think it's um, happening in ways that are not captured by your model? Oh, not even my model, but I mean, I think that people, you know, you, you bargain that the price that you come up is the result of some sort of, sort of silent bargaining process between two people that yeah. you can't really even observe. Right. So um, it's no, I, I didn't really see a way of, at least at the time of, of bringing bargaining to this, this, this situation. Well, so are you changing your mind? As you're do as you're collecting the data on what I'm going to study, yes. So no. I'm collecting the data, and I've got all this really cool data. Okay? Yeah. And so how many months? How many days is it that you're there? Uh, so I'm there for I want to say twenty, either twenty four days, maybe something like that. And what's so, the unit of observation? Is a fish price. one fish? No, no. Uh, price per box. Price per box. Yeah. And how big does the data set get? Uh, not that big. Okay. So if they sold, um, gosh, how many, see, this is the, it's been a long, long time. I totally get it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so originally actually when I originally started looking at it, I started looking at price discrimination per customer. So I had, um, four weeks of data, um, individual transactions. Uh, but then I got more data, uh, from their inventory sheets and I aggregated it to days. And when I aggregated it, gated it to days, I think I had six months of data daily. So not that much, you know, um, probably about a hundred data points of daily data on uh, price and quantity sold. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we ended up using for the causal inference part. That was the second part of my work. So you're, you're, you're starting off with an idea. What, how would you articulate how would how would the day one like you're you know of like this is what I'm going to be doing because because it sounds like it might it, it might have changed at the end. Mm -hmm. What would you have articulated you were going to be studying originally the bargaining? Yeah, I think I would have said the price of fish, how price is determined at the Fulton fish market. Okay? Got it. okay, so that's that's what I went off to study, and and I thought that you know it was kind of a competitive market. Um, but then pretty soon I saw that different ethnicities of people were getting different prices. And yep. that's what the first, um, you know, the first result was, is uh -huh. that um, Asians were actually paying less for fish than white, than, than white buyers were. Um, uh -huh. uh, and, you know, they, they, you know, you might say they, they had more outside opportunities. They were better at bargaining. They were willing to spend longer there. 
uh, whiting was really important to them, where it was usually an afterthought to the white buyers. There are all sorts of reasons why this why this was happening. Wait, um, you think it's you don't think it's price discrimination or even racial? Well, it is. It's probably, well, I mean, it's um, price discrimination based on elasticity. They their elasticity. They simply were more elastic buyers. Yeah. So it would be, you know, it's it's really economics at work, okay? Right, right. But, but then you have to explain how can they exploit that if it's really a perfectly competitive market. Mm. And at the end of the day, the market's not perfectly competitive. Okay. And that's how they could exploit it. Yeah. So I went looking, thinking about bargaining. I ended up looking at price discrimination. Mm. Um, I'm, you know, I think that happens. So yeah. yeah. If if it's like were you kind of going into it thinking, well, if there is a perfectly competitive market, it's got to be for fish because a fish is a fish and this is like a big market. Is that, was yeah, that like kind of Alfred a- Marshall in the 19th century used uh-huh. a fish market as the, the example of a perfectly competitive market. Of a perfectly competitive market. Yeah. So I've gone to, this is a traditional fish market. Is this fish market perfectly competitive? And you go through it. What is the evidence that only kind of you could see that like, you know, you're going to have to educate people now But what's the evidence that you come away with and you go, it actually is not perfectly competitive. And here's how I know. Oh, because Asian buyers are paying less for the same box of fish Mm. than a white buyer. Okay. Why is that evidence of imperfect competition? Uh, Because all of a sudden the the sellers are able to use the elasticity of the buyer Mm. and give that person a different price. If it were perfectly competitive, um, the white buyer would just go somewhere else and say, you know, it would, it would all, they would be competing it down to the same price. I mean, it would be perfect competition. It's not perfect competition because there are two prices for different types of buyers. So once you have price discrimination, you can't have perfect competition. I bet that was, I bet that was quite a discovery for you personally. Well, it was fun. It was interesting, yeah. you know, and well, then it's like, having, go ahead. Yeah forming it in ways but yes it was it was interesting to me when i saw that the asian buyers were getting lower prices on average than the white buyers it was interesting to me i think the asian buyers had no clue i don't think the white buyers had any clue uh fish fish sellers knew but that mm. that was very interesting mm. Mm. is that illegal no it wasn't illegal it's not like uh there's nothing about that that requires no uh, okay no i mean they're trying to get i mean we tried to get it i think this is where selling corn gluten mill, um, uh, you know, helped me. I would try to get the best price for the corn gluten mill that I possibly could. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if somebody needed it, you know, bad, worse than somebody else, you probably would try to give them a higher price. Now, you mm-hmm. can only do that because there's some sort of market power. Yeah. With, yeah, yeah. with corn gluten mill, there were three producers of um, wet corn milling process, um, yeah. Cargill A.E. Staley and um, ADM. Uh, but with the fish, there actually ended up only being six sellers of whiting at the market. That's okay? And they've so, been doing it forever, basically. Well, then why is there a so it seems like a natural reason to think that fish is a perfectly competitive market is both because to the non discernible, you know, economist who's never been in it, all fish looks the same. But it's also it's not really clear there's barriers to entry. So there must be barriers to entry. Uh, well, at the time, the um, mafia was down at the market. Oh my and gosh, so, you have the best um, dissertation ever. <laughs> it was kind of, I mean, it was, yeah, it was wild. I would pay to park, okay? Gladly pay to park, okay? But it was actually also kind of safe. I mean, I'd go down there, at, you know, 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, yeah. I would drive down myself every once in a while and, you know, park and walk into the market. Yeah. So try that, okay? Yeah. Um, but um, uh, yeah, so you, if you were just a regular old fish seller, you might not want to just go down and set up your own shop. Okay, it might not be behoove you to do that. Mm. Okay, so there were restrictions, barriers to entry. Wow. Uh, okay, so now moving to that is absolutely. I, I bet you, you. What did people? What was the response of of uh, your 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 advisors and like people around you? I mean. I guess you're at Princeton. It's just like, it's like every, like you said, everybody's super smart and everybody's doing cool stuff. But to me, this is like such a cool, such a cool project. Uh, so, so the, the, the paper that ends up in the review of economic studies is co-authored with Josh Angris and Hito Embens. And, you know, now that they won the Nobel prize, it, it's like you, you kind of 
also have a light cast on that dissertation, which is, it was kind of part of a also new realizations about instrumental variables. And I just kind of thought it might be neat to just talk for a second. Um, uh, first, how did you get involved with those two? Yeah. So first of all, can I connect, let me connect the price discrimination part to the estimation of demand. Okay? Yes. Yeah. So once I, you know, we wanted an explanation. Why was there price discrimination? Okay. And right. my hypothesis was that it was based on elasticity. Yeah. Okay. So all of a sudden I needed to estimate elasticity. Yeah. So that's how I got to the demand estimation. Okay. And in the very first paper I did, I did it rather clumsily. Um, I used a uh, wind speed and wave height just um, um, uh uh, and I and I estimated different elasticities for um, Asian buyers and white buyers. So okay. this is this is like stormy weather instruments out at sea on the day that they got the fish. Right. Exactly. Why is that an instrument? Uh, because it affects supply, but it shouldn't. You have to make the argument it doesn't affect demand, and so buyers wouldn't deter um, whether it's sea didn't have an effect on or had a marginal effect on the um, land. But that's the argument that you have to make. Got it. Okay. Got it. So, so I have now, I think about a hundred data points. I want to say maybe, maybe 140, I don't know, um, uh, days. And um, it's a pretty accessible data set and it's also clean. So it, and it cleanish in the sense that it's not hard to explain my instrument. The yeah. fact that whether it's C affects how much fish you catch, but it doesn't affect how much fish you buy. And that's what you need. Clean. Okay. Can you, can you just elaborate real quick on clean? Why, uh, why are you using that word? Probably not a technical word. Okay? No, but I think it's, it's helpful for. Yeah, it's, it's so the the idea of the instrument, it's not um, people aren't going to argue too much with you. Everybody will always argue with you. Right. But wind and wave height at sea is a good instrument for the amount of fish demanded on land. Okay, mm -hmm. And I think that's what I mean is it, it's not it's not a leap of faith that this is uh, a, that, that, that wind and waves are exogenous. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They come and, and they, they affect supply and probably don't affect demand. Okay. Did people argue with you nevertheless, though, when you would give this talk on the like, uh, was, was it the same kind of intense arguing about instruments at that time as I sort of think about now? Or was they, were oh, they yeah. a lot oh, more yeah. openly accepting it? No, no. I mean, people would would argue. And I, I think that we you know ended up putting in. Um, uh, I forget some other controls and, you know, just to make sure that these. Yeah, you've got fixed. those day of week fixed effects. Yeah, day, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, um, uh, no, I mean, people always, but, but as far as it goes, it was, it was a, you know, easy to explain and kind of believable. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, I went to the UK. Okay. Right after I did my, my uh, finished my thesis in four years, I went straight off to Oxford to do a, J, a junior research fellow. Ship mm -hmm. at Oxford. And um, Guido was in the UK at that time. And I think he'd heard about the fish data and they liked the fact that it was easily explainable and, you know, easy to use. Mm -hmm. And so they asked, you know, they said, you know, they had this um, average treatment effect and they wanted to apply average treatment effects to a demand function. Oh. And so uh, this was a good data set on which to use it and explain it. So that's how I got involved with Ito and Josh. But you were already sort of doing it, right? Because you were already using the supply instruments. Oh yeah, yeah, no, I already had my instruments and um, they basically looked at binary instruments and they had a different theoretical interpretation of it being um, just an average, average movement. So not so much the structural supply demand interpretation um, and they wanted to apply this um, average treatment effect to a demand and supply situation. Did that seem like did that theoretical approach? Did it seem all that novel to you, or were you already? I mean, I, like what? It, what was? What, what was the? You mentioned this like structural average treatment effect. So I'm just curious, like what? What was really your... non-structural average treatment effect versus a structural effect? Basically. Right, right. I would say non-structural. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. They were both, um, you know, Guido was just a fantastic econometrician and um, uh, Josh, um, you know, had already been working in IV for many years. So um, hmm. uh, frankly, I was flattered they wanted to, you know, they wanted to work with me on this project. 
Yeah. So, um, so yes, I was already, I already had my instruments. It was, um, she, I want to give credit. It was Angus Deaton's idea to go out and get uh, uh, weather and wave height. Okay. That's so, great. And he's story. another Nobel prize winner who actually, you know, so, um, um, so he told you, so, so he, he said, yeah, he said, look, you can't just regress twice in quantity, you know, quantity on prize. I'm a, you know, young graduate student. You got to go out and get an instrument. What about, you know, what about wind and waves? Yeah. Or, yeah. or not, I don't know if you said wind and waves, but what about weather? Can you use the weather, right. you know? And that's when, right. um, yeah. The classic instrumental variables, you know, the very first Philip Wright's first instrument was rainfall when he was okay. estimating, uh, uh, elasticities of like, it was like elasticities of the, of, I think it was like pork or something, or, or maybe it was like, he's doing all these like tariffs of gosh, what is it? It's in my book. Um, but he, he instruments with, uh, I believe he act, I think actually the very first one was, was, uh, was rainfall. I could be wrong about that, but I think that's yeah. right. Yeah. It's yeah, just very it's classic to use these, like these weather instruments. Yeah. Cause they're exogenous. Well, so, uh, I, I, so you, you, you do that work and then you kind of leave, you, you seem like you leave fish and then you go into art and creativity. But uh, I'm curious a little bit about what that transition is. Is that what, where, where how do you start? Cause the bulk of all of your Vita is tons of work on the economics of art and creativity. Yeah. Well, it started by price discrimination and even um, I worked on the, um, uh, Angrist and Kruger, um, uh, I, I got their their fast food prices. The third paper of my thesis was getting their fast food prices and using the pricing data to test whether um, different areas based on the racial composition and wealth of an area paid different prices for fast food. And that the was- Carden Kruger? Carden Kruger, yeah. Carden Kruger, you, you yeah, were, so this, were collecting the data for Carden Kruger? No, no, I, I didn't collect their data, okay. I, well, actually, I think I helped them sort out their data, clean their data a little bit, but I, they, they let me use their ham. They, they weren't using the pricing data in the first, or they were only using it marginally. But they let me use their pricing data to test whether different areas to correlate prices of hamburgers with uh, the race and um, uh, uh, income statistics of an area. Oh, and so I have a paper in the, um, anyway, I, I have a, a, a published paper on that. Oh, so you were just, you, you just were, it was, it's this line, the lot, the, the thread is this price discrimination. Yeah. I was very interested in pricing and price discrimination. I'm uh, still interested in pricing and price discrimination. It just, yeah. it, um, it's, it, it's interesting. And so, so then when I went into art, it was really because I was interested in galleries. Um, but the galleries wouldn't really talk to me. Okay. Because you know, you, there are no posted prices. So what's the similarity? It's like fish. You'd go, you know, there, there weren't posted prices at the time in many of the galleries and they would, depending on who you were, you would get a, get a different price. Mm -hmm. um, but the galleries wouldn't talk to me. So um, I'd gone into London, said, well, I'll just go over to Christie's and see what I can nose around and find. And that's when I went down to the basement and um, made friends with the librarian. And at that point in time, nobody had put in together any art data. It was one of the very first art data sets to put. Now, of course, they're available everywhere. Right. And so I put together, um, again, looking at art, it, it was, you know, it's pleasant looking at art catalogs. Um, I put together a data set um, on contemporary art with mm. uh, prices and characteristics of the paintings. From these archives? From the archives, yeah. I, so I, I, and it was for, you said it's for Christie's? Yeah, I went down to Christie's on King Street in London. How far was back did you go? You mean in the archives? Yeah, how far, how many years back did you go? Oh, I did 1982 two to 92. It was contemporary art. So I didn't go, but I mean, you have to say, so you have to find the auction catalog. So you have to, at least at that point in time, you didn't just go to a, you didn't just go online. Okay. And download your art data. There just, it wasn't available. Right. So you had to get, you could go to a library, but the yeah. nice thing about going to Christie's is they had the, um, the pricing sheets. You can yeah. even see some of the reserves. So I got the guy, I got some of the reserve, some, you know, the pricing and I've got some of the bid sheets too. And so um, I um, so by going going there, you could not only get the catalogs, but you could get the prices, whether it was sold or unsold. And and that's, um, you know, I don't know. That's that's what I ended up doing. That was my. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, is it is it was it like an adrenaline rush a little bit doing all that kind of being in the archives and, you know, you know, writing down all these old prices and feeling like a 
Well, they weren't really old prices, but it was kind of fun when I saw the secret reserve price on one of the sheets that I don't think I was supposed to see. Okay. So, um, <laughs> but, but putting together, I mean, you're putting together something that nobody's done before. You all of a sudden have this data that you can work with, that you yeah. can play with. Okay. Right. And nobody's ever asked any questions whatsoever on this yeah. data set. Yeah. And that's what got me excited. Like when I got the, when I first got the Fulton fish market data, the yeah. pricing data, I like couldn't, you know, I was so, so excited to go and to start, you know, playing with it, to, to graphing it, seeing what's in there. And um, it, it was just very exciting. And so when you've got a data set that nobody's ever worked on before, it, it's just kind of fun, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I completely uh, agree. Uh, it can be intoxicating. You, you, you can be a little, you know, you have to be really disciplined, though, to then figure out what the paper is going to be about. Right. Um, You've got to come up with a story and an idea and then you need yeah. something to test. And absolutely. And you don't want to, you know, you, you don't want to have the data lead you too much. And but but so, yes, exactly. Well, maybe that's where, you know, your background with 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 Rubenstein and just that starting out in so deep in theory ha, ha, was really helpful because it seems like you just always had ideas and, and collecting data. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe that, that's yeah. an interesting. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, so, so, um, uh, I, I, I was a literature major and I wrote poetry. I sort of specialized in creative writing. I wrote poetry in high school and college. And, um, and I think like as a kid, uh, you, you, especially when you move into college, like you sort of think of the artist as like either, they're part of a school, you know, like they're part of the abstract expressionist school or the beatnik writers, or you think of them as like driven by this, like almost internal creative drive. But I'm imagining that it's more complex because you're studying art in markets. And I was just wondering, you know, is there something that you've learned about art that you know you think is the insights of economics that just is is maybe demystifies or maybe adds to the 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 mystery of art that a lot of people don't know yes okay i've got something i can explain easily it's probably one of my favorite papers is um uh so people have always thought that that artists needed to suffer to do good work so there's this myth of the suffering of you know suffering of artists so um i actually you can kind of test them, okay, in, in some ways. So um, I looked at, um, uh, so, and I'll ask you, what would you think? So the wife or the child or the spouse of an artist dies, okay? Yeah. What do you think happens to the price of that artist's work in the bereavement period? You know, when he's sad and, or, you know, she's sad and they're bereaving these deaths relative to the prices of works produced at other times of their lives. Okay. So the, the artist dies and there was a period of time with, so no, not so the we, artist, the spouse, the family member dies, the family member dies. You got the family. Oh, member yeah. dies. You're doing, okay. this is the, this is the, the suffering artist. His, his suffering has gone up. So his work is better. So the prices should be higher. And you're going to tell me it's not, not, no, it's not. not. Okay. So, not. so, so what, what, what's going on? So, so prices are about 30% less during They're the less. first year to two, you know, after the death of an artist. Okay? Oh my gosh. Um, and if you talk to a psychologist, they probably wouldn't buy into your theory on suffering artists. Okay. Yeah. Right. So there's, it's, uh, so, it's so incapacitating. Yeah. It's and so there's, debilitating. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, I use the theory I used to explain it is a Mihai, she sent me high, um, uh, came up with flow theory. So it's the art, the idea that if you're creative, you're in a flow and, yeah. you know, he even gives the example that a death in the family, you know, interrupts your flow. You can't create, you have problems. Yeah. Uh, so um, that that's the idea. But so that's something that, you know, I mean, so when you say, are they less creative? You have to be careful. Maybe, maybe the paintings they paint are darker and they're just, people don't like them as much. They might be every bit as creative. I mean, and I can't, though, though I look at our paintings painted in that period less or more likely to be in museums, they're also less likely to be in museum collections versus other paintings. Mm. So, um, but that's the sort of thing. You've got this data, um, people aren't looking at it for these sorts of things. You've got prices and you can test out these ideas that nobody's, I mean. But that's like such a clever, 
that's like, you know, when I think about the causal inference stuff that you're getting from your training, you know, thinking about these natural experiments and things like that, that's such a clever way to disentangle causality from selection. Maybe the people who have been working on, uh, you know, like really great work who were suffering were just, it just was selection. It was never, it was never the, the suffering. It was just, that's just who they were. And then when you look at this exogenous shock of suffering, you can find, in fact, it's the opposite. Yeah, it's the opposite in the immediate years. That's not to say that it doesn't, I don't know. I can't say what happens later on, really. I don't have the data, right. but, um, right. um, uh, but yeah. How'd you get that idea? That's the, that's not really a price. Is that a price discrimination? I mean, you're looking. Well, it's pricing. It's not, no, it's not price discrimination at all. It's pricing at different times. Um, uh, I was at a conference and uh, somebody was looking at sickness of composers. And I think they had three composers they were looking at. And I thought, hmm, I can do this with probably 12,000 paintings and 60 artists. So I spent some time working in the, you know, collecting you, the data. You collected 12,000 paintings from those well, artists? Well, see, now all of a sudden this was later. So you could start um, uh, oh. downloading stuff by this time. And mm. you, know, you would buy the CDs. And so I could download the painting data, but I had to go to the library to read the biography data because you had to find the desk. And yeah. so oh. um, that was the harder part of this. So getting the painting by that point, um, the, 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 the painting data was readily available. Well, it was when I started, there were no data sets. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're such a, leave, but you're, you're like the, 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 you're the, the picture of the, the, you're the picture of the econ of the, 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 the scientific scholarly yeah. economist. I think that such a great role model for, for people. I mean, um, uh, um, that's just, what did people think? What did, have you ever, did you get the sense you ever shown, you, did, did, does your work uh, get read, you think, by art historians that can like say, oh, this is like, because it's really, you've written just a ton on pricing and you're touching on all of their folklore. Well, um, I can give you a, I can give you two examples, okay? One, one may be not so favorable and one may be more favorable, okay? Um, uh, one of our professors, um, I, by the way, I taught a course here called Economics of the Arts with an art historian and I loved it. It was great. I did it for 10 years and it was just so much fun. Mm -hmm. But there was another professor here. Um, there's this artist, um, no, art critic called Roger, Roger DePue um, in from the, I want to say 18th century, okay? And he would give um, artists, um, like the great artists, um, uh, you know, Michelangelo, he'd give them grades based on the, how their color schemes, um, their creativity, um, their ability to draw. Uh, there were four, four areas. And so you have these numbers now that he would actually rank the artists. And so um, I took the rankings and I looked at whether or not the um, price increases and the prices at auctions for the higher ranking artists were higher and whether or not um, they, they tended to um, increase more over time. And the art historian, real, art historians really can't stand Roger DePia. They, they say that, you know, for somebody to grade artists based on, um, uh, you know, a grading scale is just antithetical to what you should be doing. Right. Um, and I would say he was a good critic. He tried to, you know, rationalize the process. So in that sense, the work, you know, I had some trouble getting, you know, we didn't necessarily see eye to eye on that work. Yeah. Um, but um, um, I mean, against that, I've worked a lot on artist resale rights, which um, artists are very interested in. Um, economists sometimes have different opinions on artist resale rights. I've done a lot of empirical work on that. Mm. And just most recently I got asked, I, I wrote a joint paper on color and art uh, with one of my colleagues in Amsterdam. And um, I think we're gonna work again on that. So. Um, you love um, this research? Yeah, and I'm um, slightly sad that I'm an administrator now and I don't get to do as much of it as I would like. But well, yeah, I like doing research. I like, it's fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, so yeah. what drew you into administration? You're the dean at, at Brandeis. Is it, is it what, what, when, what, what was that, that, that transition about? 
uh, I think it was coming here. I spent the first uh, 15 years in the UK and came here um, um, as um, you know, just a professor in the economics department and loved it for the first couple of years because I didn't have to do any admin. So I was already starting to do admin at Oxford. But then, you know, you're part of a department and somebody needs to be chair. So, you know, I, it was kind of my turn. So um, I became chair um, and I think did a decent job, but I was happy to give it up after three years because somebody else who was there was really good and wanted to be chair. And I mean, that's the way it works. Yeah. Um, but then they needed a PhD director and then the dean here left and the founding dean came back and said he would be dean, but he asked me, would I please be senior associate dean? And, you know, he, I, you know, Peter Petri was, is, is his name. He's fantastic. He was a great mentor. And I said, yes. And then you're senior associate dean. And then, you know, you, the deanship comes up and I've been dean now for four years. Um, You've and been dean for four? I've been dean for four years now. Yeah. 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 That's a longer tenure, though, usually dean. It seems like we the deans we've had that are like they kind of hang around for a while or it's like a, it seems like when you become chair, you're like you like come chair, you step down. But like when you become dean, you're like, I am now I have a new career. Yeah, that's a little bit like it. And in fact, when I stepped down from being chair, I got went on sabbatical. And that's when I wrote the death of bereavement and creativity paper is I was bored. Okay. I think it's important to be bored. So, you know, um, uh, and that's, that's when that paper got the idea for that paper and that paper got written. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, um, I've been now doing administration. I was, I was senior associate doing pretty heavy administration for six years now. Well, so and, what makes you, let me, what, what are the, what makes you good at being a Dean when, when, when somebody's good at being, they say that that person's a great Dean. What are the, what is it that the attributes and what is the outputs that are involved in that? Um, you know, um, I think listening to people and bringing everybody along with you. Okay. So that, I mean, at least those are my strengths. Okay. Mm -hmm. So really listening and, and bringing everybody along with you. And I'm sure different great deans have different strengths, mm -hmm. but, um, uh, you know, and, and I see us, I'm not going to, you know, I see us as a, I, I like Brandeis. I've been here forever and I like my colleagues very, very much. And so, it's important that we're all headed in the same direction and that we're all buying into everything that's going on here. Yeah. 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 Well, so imagine, you know, if you could just talk to, uh, you know, like a high school student, I'll kind of conclude with this. Like if you had the ability to go talk to like a, like a high, like a group of high school students who do, have no clue what economics even is, you know, and you just sort of had to boil it, like kind of give the elevator pitch to them about, well, I have really loved it. What, what would you, what, what would, what would you be trying to help them understand that, that makes economics really special? Uh, so I've, I don't know. I've always engaged with markets. I think markets are just very interesting, but that's me. I think different people have different interests. So if you have an interest in markets, um, and you have an interest in finding out things that nobody else knows. Um, now, you can do this in lots of different disciplines, but that those are the kind of, I, for me, those were the, you know, that's what drew me into economics. Yeah, so, yeah. but, but it's like, it, it's the topic, but when I listen to you describe, it, it's also like, you were just, you, you just have all this like, what David Friedman uh, said about uh, John Snow, just all this shoe leather, you know, just like getting out there, smelling up like a bunch of fish, you know, digging through old records and, you know, just like being, it seemed like who you, you, a person hearing it's about markets, I don't think they would go, oh, and that that's what it means. It seems like it's, it, it's been for you, it's been like whatever you want to study. Yeah, no, um, it has allowed, it allows you, if you've got a good idea and if you're an academic and you're in, in a university, you can pursue that idea. And yeah. I think, so this is a general sort of plug for, um, for research. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, for, for, for liking, for liking research now economics in particular, as you say, I mean, different people have different strengths. I mean, my strength wasn't being a pure theoretician. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, my strength is some combination of being strong in, in math and statistics. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, but also being able to express myself and actually being honest, I like people. 
And I mean, you know, I well, probably everybody likes people, but maybe, maybe, maybe my research has gone more the way it has because I have been more interested in getting out there. And maybe that's the same reason I'm a dean. I have not thought about this, but you brought it up. So it's yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That's neat. Um I think that you have done such cool work. It's uh, I I am really excited that you're on this. And and I mentioned this off camera, but I'll just mention it again. Your Fulton Fish is uh, uh, in my my mixtape book, and um, in the mythology of causal inference, and the way that I kind of think about it in my brain, it's it's like this history of of IV is just such a central part of the story and simultaneous equations and supply and demand is a central part of the story of both economics models and IV. And it's neat that your paper uh, is so clean. It's such a neat, it's like, you know, we can go into our principles class and we can show, look, you can only get this elasticity if you move this curve or if you shift this curve. And, um, it's one of these areas where econometrics and research and causality is right there day one in your principles class. When you think about it, all of your research, like perfect competition and demand elasticities and shifting, it's so neat the way it's like, it's just kind of like the full scope and story of economics in a lot of ways. Yeah, no, I agree. And the data is not hard to work with. It's not like, you know, you need, you know, 3,000, you know, 300,000 data points to, to, to find this out. Right. And um, yeah, no, it, it was, it, it was fun and it, it was clearly fun. Okay. And, yeah. and, it, and it's, and it's interesting. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much for having me, for letting me have you, let, letting me talk to you for, for, for this time. I really appreciate it. It's nice to, it's nice to, to, to meet. Thank you, Scott. It's a real privilege to talk, talk about the work and it's fun. So thank you for, for listening to me. Okay. 